So good afternoon and welcome. Let's everybody has a seat. Welcome to the Spinelli Building uh, in the, the EPRS uh, reading room. Uh, this event is in presence. It's also web streamed and be prepared. It's also being filmed and recorded and it will be later uh, broadcasted on YouTube. So we are making history today. And since we are still in January, I would like to uh, wish you uh, all the best for the new year to come. Uh, for the first book talk of the year, we are privileged to have uh, a conversation between uh, Walter Wolf, the author of the book, and uh, Klaus Weller. The book is called European Political Parties, Party Finance Reform for Funding Democracy. Uh, and uh, Klaus Weller was recently, uh, until recently, Secretary General of the Parliament, will be in this conversation together with Maria Diaz Cargo, who is an analyst in the Members Research Service and Specialist of Constitutional Affairs. What are you? are currently lecturer at the University of Leuven, and the book is in fact your PhD, and it has been published last year. And actually, I understand that you started your research and your thinking uh, some years ago where you were stagiaires, not far from this very place. At the time, it was uh, Director General for Presidency, and it was the transparency unit, that's some years ago. But I understand also that in the meanwhile, you kept our colleagues of DG Finance busy, uh, putting them questions, uh, uh, and uh, that helped you to complete your work, and I greet uh, our colleague, the Director General for Finance, Didier Cleti, today. So, uh, we are happy that uh, you shared these findings uh, with us today, and you explore in the book the funding of Euro parties as a prerequisite for EU democracy, maybe, maybe not the only one prerequisite. You explore the way Euro parties become driving forces of EU politics, but you also question the rules that are governing them, daring to call it sometimes a straight jacket. So that's going to be a very interesting discussion today. Uh, this discussion is going to happen with uh, Klaus Weller. As I said, he has been for 13, more than 13 years in charge of the House as Secretary General, which means the head of the administration, uh, but also the chief uh, advisor uh, for the political authorities. And in this capacity, he was in the driving seat for engaging reforms, uh, the creation of the authority. And I greet also my colleague Pascal Chonard here and also putting the means at the disposal of the, of the parties and political families. You were also yourself, Klaus, in leading position in party structures, so you have an experience also from the inside, if I may say so. This event comes at a very timely moment for two reasons. First of all, because the Parliament, as you know, is discussing a reform of the party financing with uh, the two co-rapporteurs, Vice President Rainer Wieland and Charles Gerhans. And not uh, earlier than this morning, there was a discussion uh, at the AFCO committee where the Swedish presidency presented their view. Let's hope that things will move ahead soon on this. Um, the presidency indicated that there were two major issues of concern for the Council financing of national referenda and contributions from non-EU political parties to Euro parties and uh, showed somehow that the second was particularly sensitive due to the possible risks of foreign interferences in the EU democratic process. So discussions are going on. A second reason why it's uh, so important uh, and so timely to discuss this today is because in less than 18 months, we will have the new parliament. So time is going to go very fast in the months ahead. Uh, and the political parties are going to contribute to uh, the discussion at European level on political priorities for the new parliament, but also the other institutions. And it's going to happen this year. Just uh, before handing uh, the moderation to Maria, I'd just like to make a small comment on the side of the EPRS. I mentioned the shaping of the political parties. We are in the EPRS providing tools for this uh, work on various fronts. Some uh, issues that we have been exploring in the 10 issues to watch for the year 2023 that were presented in this room two weeks ago. We have done some work on the treaty potential. We have done some work on citizens' expectations on what can be the toolbox that is put in front of these citizens' expectations. And also more recently as a result of the successive crises, we have experienced some work on risks, analysis, and also the capabilities to put in front of them. So it's not at all prescribing the agenda, but I mention this because they are very valuable toolboxes 
uh, for uh, the political parties and families to elaborate uh, their programs in the weeks and months to come. So I stop here my introduction, uh, introductory remarks. Uh, I hand over for the moderation to Maria and I wish you an excellent uh, discussion today. Uh, very much looking forward. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. So, dear Etienne, thank you very much for your, for your words. And uh, dear speakers, dear all, welcome to today's first EPRS uh, Book Talk of the Year. We are very pleased to have you all here, both on site and online. And just uh, a first reminder for those who are participating online, I would like to let you know that if you would like to put questions after the presentations by our two speakers, you can do it through a slider using the QR codes that we have provided. And now that I've given these, uh, let's say, technical indications, let's start with our book talk, which deals, uh, which deals or digs into a topic that is very timely, as said already by Etienne, because indeed, core legislators are now focusing, deciding, discussing a possible modification of the rules that apply to the statute and financing of European political parties. But if you allow me, this is a topic that is also a very sensitive and controversial one. Because if you see, we are going to talk today about money and politics. We are going to talk today about the financing of our democracy. And we are going to do it by digging, as I was saying, into how European political parties are financed at the EU level. And usually, when it comes to this question, how political parties are financed, there are many, many questions that arise. For example, should political parties receive public funding or should they rely on private funds? Should individual contributions be capped to avoid excessive dependence from just one single contributor? Or should political parties be completely free to receive any amount of money from anyone, anytime? Should contributions to political parties um, come from only natural persons? from only nationals, maybe to avoid, uh, let's say, undecided or malicious even interferences, or, as I was saying before, complete freedom should be granted. Should all political parties receive public funding, or should public funding be limited only to those political parties that have representation in parliament, or that have enough citizen support. As you can see, there are many questions that arise. And the answer to these questions have indeed an impact on the political party system of a given polity. And it is also the case in the EU, of course. And these questions, together with some others, have been rising, have been addressed by Bouter Bold's book. So we are going to dig into these questions. And if you go into the book, you will see that, in fact, our author, Walter Bowles, in his book, leads us to the process through which European political parties were created in the 70s, then to the moment in which they received, for the first time, funding in 2004. And he raises the question of how the funding regime of European political parties has changed over time. What have been the, out, the actors of those changes and also the beneficiaries of those changes? And he also digs into the, most, the more general question, as said by Etienne, of how those changes, those changes in the funding system, in the funding regime, have somehow saved the European the European political party system and what has been their impact in the role of European political parties in the EU democratic system. So without taking more time, because the important thing is to listen to our author, <laughs> I'll give the floor to Bauter Wolf, the author of our book. 
that is, as said already by Etienne, researcher and lecturer at the, at the University of Leven and a very well-known or reputed expert on European political parties. So please, Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. It is an enormous pleasure and honor uh, to present my book, European Political Parties and Party Finance Reform, Funding Democracy? Question mark. It's a place, actually, and uh, Director Basso already referred to it, where my professional career began. The first thing I did after university was an internship here at the Library of the European Parliament, dealing with transparency, access to documents, and relations with interest representatives. So issues that, are, that have rarely been as topical as they are today. I'm also quite happy that the two people that are at the origins uh, of this book are here today, my PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Steve van Ecke, and my co-supervisor, Professor Bart Maddas, and also to see so many people that have contributed to this book in big or small ways, and they are either here physically present or online. I also want to express my gratitude to the European Parliamentary Research Service and the Library for hosting the event, to Director Etienne Basso, to Maria uh, Diaz Grego, and to former Secretary General Klaus Welle for their thoughts, remarks, and undoubtedly critical observations, I hope at least. Um, it is an impossible task to summarize a book of almost 300 pages in less than 20 minutes, so I decided to structure uh, my presentation around four main statements, uh, which I also put into a PowerPoint presentation, which will be so shown now in a, a couple of seconds. And it's about the funding for European political parties and foundations, two more positive statements and two more negative statements. They're also slightly provocative, perhaps, in order to foster some discussion. Okay. And uh, the first of my statements, and uh, then the presentation can maybe start, is Euro Party funding. There we go. Euro party funding is a necessary but insufficient condition for EU democracy. First statement. So let me start with the observation that modern democracy without political parties is empirically almost non-existent. Political parties are essential to a democracy. And it also means that a democratic European Union requires genuine political parties and genuine party politics. And luckily, I would say, we have political parties also at the European level. level eh? They really exist. These are the 10 European political parties that are currently registered in uh, the EU. And I hope that all or at least some of these names sound familiar to you. Maybe less known to some is that these organizations are almost half a century old. The first uh, of these European political parties were established in the 1970s, in the run-up to the first direct elections to the European Parliament in 1979. And that actually means that some of these organizations are older than the majority of the national political parties in the European Union that exist today. During these first uh, elections, these Euro parties were even quite visible. In several, in several countries. An example of three campaign posters that were used at the time. On the left, you can see a poster of the Dutch Liberals with their European affiliation, European Liberal Democrats, Democrats clearly visible. In the center, a poster from uh, former Belgian Prime Minister Leo Tindemans for a real Europe with the National Party CVP, CVP, and the European Party, EVP, EPP, next to each other. On the right, a poster of uh, Fine Gael from Ireland with the logo of the EPP, and the text that they, as a party, can serve voters better, and I quote, because they are part of the European People's Party that has real strength and purpose. A European Party affiliation as a quality label, you could say. So I can imagine that there are people in the Euro parties today that would move heaven and earth to have such a visibility during the European electoral campaigns. So European political parties have been around for quite some time, but in order to play their democratic role, they require financial resources and they have received these resources. In 2004, 
public funding for European political parties and later also for their affiliated political foundations was established. And on this graph, you can see if you follow the black solid line that the funding for European political parties and foundations has substantially increased from less than 9 million euros in 2004 to up to 70 million euros today. This is in prices of January 2022, so controlled for inflation. So what you can see is that in almost every year, the rise of the grants to Europe parties has been higher than the increase of the total budget of the European Parliament. And in the last couple of years, the budget for the extra parliamentary European political parties is comparable to the budget for the political groups inside the European Parliament. So we spend almost as much on the political parties outside of Parliament than we spend on political parties and political groups inside the European Parliament. And this growing funding has allowed the European political parties to gain autonomy from their corresponding political groups and to professionalize their internal organization. But it has not been sufficient to fulfill their democratic role. And I will come back to that later during this presentation. Second statement, Euro party funding has been an irresistible force in EU politics. Something that has become clear when we consider the attitude of the more Eurosceptic parties in this regard. Both the concept of European political parties and Euro party funding has been heavily criticized by Eurosceptic parties and Eurosceptic politicians. They were called artificial, not real parties. But of course, this, the growing financial resources that were available posed a dilemma for Eurosceptics. Either they had to remain true to their ideological position and refrain from participating in the Euro party system, or they would have to establish European parties of their own to receive funding counter to their ideological considerations. Right? And this can be illustrated by this quote from a Eurosceptic MEP on the available funding for Euro parties. He said, it is a dilemma because you talk about an arms race that is going on. So it is in that way very cleverly constructed that if you're in principle against this money, you have a disadvantage. And if you take the money, then you're a hypocrite. But as we will see, most Eurosceptics evolve from a position of principled opposition to strategic pragmatism in a way. In this graph, you can see the share of MEPs that is formally affiliated to a European political party. That is, in a way, a member of a European political party. On the top of the graph, you can see the light blue dashed line that shows that around 95% of the non-Eurosceptic MEPs has been consistently affiliated to a European political party. So almost all non-Eurosceptic MEPs have been part of a European political party. With the Eurosceptic MEPs, that is the gray dotted line, it is a bit different. In 2005, the second year of Euro party funding, only 20% of the Eurosceptic MEPs was affiliated to a Euro party. Whereas in 2016, and more than 10 years later, that was almost 80%. So you see, most of them became part of a European party organization. Most of them took a pragmatic position uh, and established European political parties of their own. Some of these Eurosceptics even applied a strategy of what you can call budget maximization. The establishment of as many parties as possible in order to maximize EU funding. And in some cases, one could even question whether the Euro parties really existed. For example, I went to uh, a registered headquarters of one of the Euro parties in Brussels, which was apparently a, an apartment above a uh, hairdresser's salon on the ground floor. Yeah. Apart from a withered label on the post box, there was no sign of any European political party. We also talked to the neighbors. Nobody knew anything about a political party. Research journalists did similar investigations with other Euro parties and came to the same conclusion. So, in other words, some of these Euro parties were nothing more than what you can call phantom parties or even Potemkin parties eh, that merely existed on paper. But even politicians and parties that opposed European political parties became part of the Euro party system. That is also something that is clear from this. Going to my uh, third statement, Euro party funding is stuck in the past. And this statement mainly relates to the organizational nature of European political parties and their ties to society in general. In the book, 
I argue that the finance regime solidifies European political parties as elite-driven umbrella organizations of national political parties. There are only limited incentives for the involvement of individual citizens, for example. There is, we have to admit, an incentive in the funding rules to stimulate the Euro parties to look for financial support in society. They have to match the money that they receive from the European budget with their own financial resources, may it be membership contributions or donations or other sources of income. In other words, if a European party cannot collect sufficient own resources, their EU funding is lowered. So there is basically a ceiling on the subsidies that they can receive, eh, comparable to the relative upper limit that also exists in Germany, for example, with regard to political parties. So this table gives an overview of the share of the maximum grant that European political parties received. What you will notice if you look at the graph is that there are quite a number of years in which European party only received 80%, 70%, or in some cases even less than 50% of their maximum grant. And an important reason for this is that the European party could not collect sufficient own resources to match the grant, as already explained. This is probably all the more striking if you know that over time the financial incentive for European parties was lowered. In the beginning, they had to collect at least 25% of own resources in their entire budget, and this was lowered further to 15% and then to 10%, and now we are even discussing, uh, we're seeing proposals of lowering this co-financing obligation, as it is called, even more. If we then have a look at where the own resources come from, we can see that most European political parties get their funding from membership contributions. That is in bright blue in the different uh, bar charts here. Only a few European parties relied heavily on donations, for example. These are the yellow colors in uh, the bar charts. We also have to admit that these membership contributions are mainly composed of contributions from member parties and not from individual members, so the national parties. If you know that also at national level these member parties are heavily supported by public funding, the total level of state support for European political parties go goes up even more. And this entails the risk that European political parties no longer have any incentive to develop a membership base to look for financial support in society and that they might become what we political scientists call semi-state agencies. They will almost become part of the state instead of part of society with uh, risks that are linked to this. Last statement, the Euro party finance regime is a regulatory straitjacket. Several provisions in the funding rules prevent European political parties from properly fulfilling their democratic role. For example, the ban on member contributions from non-EU parties, it was already mentioned, the strict separation between the finances of national and European parties. But I want to focus now on the limitations that are imposed on European political parties when it comes to their role in the elections to the European Parliament. This is all the more important because participation in the European elections is actually a necessary condition in order to receive EU funding. If you don't participate in the elections, then you lose your European grants. Yet, their possibilities to campaign in these elections are substantially thwarted by regulatory framework that is currently in place. And I will give two examples. The first is about the Spitzenkandidat process. During the 2014 and 2019 European election, most European political parties put forward so-called Spitzenkandidat. And these, those were their candidates for the presidency of the European Commission, their electoral figureheads, uh, so to speak, their electoral leaders. You can see the various candidates on, uh, on the slide. However, the funding rules include a provision that the EU public funding cannot be used to support national candidates. But this had the remarkable consequence that European political parties could finance campaigns for their Spitzenkandidat in every European country, except in the country where he or she was on the ballot. 
Yeah, that is quite remarkable. This meant, for example, that the Party of European Socialists could campaign for their lead candidate, Frans Timmermans, uh, the second from the right, in all EU countries except in his home country, the Netherlands, where he was heading the list of the Dutch Labour Party. This is maybe even stranger if you know that uh, there were no such limitations for the ALDE party to campaign with Margareta Vestager in her home country, Denmark, because she was not on the electoral list of her national party. In other words, from a campaign finance perspective, it can be more beneficial if your Spitzenkandidat is not an actual candidate in the European elections, which is very, very strange indeed. And the second point that I want to make uh, is the lack of harmonization of national electoral and campaign finance rules. This slide gives a visual overview of the different rules that are in place in the different member states with regard to social media advertising, traditional media advertising, third party campaigning and campaign expenditure limits. The details are not as important, but what you can clearly see is yeah, you have very different systems. And these are also the rules that the European political parties have to adhere to when they conduct electoral campaigns. From a regulatory point of view, what you have is a form of what I would call democratic, democratic silification. 27 different countries with 27 different systems. This substantially hampers the ability of European political parties to campaign in the European elections because you have to take all of these rules into consideration. And this led a party official to use the following football metaphor to describe their situation. And I quote, we are asked to play in the European Champions League, yet the many restrictions in the current rules compel us to play with a ping pong ball, with our shoelaces tied together, and to compete on 27 different football pitches at the same time with completely different and often contradictory rules of the game. To sum up, the public funding for European political parties and foundations has allowed them to strengthen their position and find their own place in the political system of the European Union. However, changes to the current regulatory framework are absolutely necessary to bring the European parties in the 21st century and to allow them to unlock their full democratic potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauta. <laughs> it's been a really content-rich presentation in, the, in which you, you have really covered lots of ground eh? from, from the historical origins of our European political parties to, to the, the, the current situation as regards funding and also political campaigning at the EU level. So thank you very much for this. And now, um, in the second part of the of the book talk, we we move to our second speaker. Um, I think our second speaker does not really need an introduction in this house, uh, because <laughs> we all know him. Of course, he was our secretary general until a few weeks ago, in fact. But uh, even if he does not need an introduction in in this house, I. I, I cannot help uh, reminding our audience that uh, Klaus Welle, our second speaker, has held key positions in crucial moments for the life of the current financing model of European political parties. As it was already highlighted a little bit by, by Etienne in his presentation, at the end of the 19th, when the Treaty of Nice was being discussed and we were thinking about introducing a legal basis for granting funding to European political parties, Klaus Welle was already there. He was the Secretary General of the EPP first and of the EPP political group afterwards, so he had a very important and prominent position in the biggest political party that was pushing to modify the treaties to help Euro parties to have financing. Then later, in 2003, when the first regulation on the statute and funding of European political parties was being negotiated, he was director of internal policies in this house. 
And we find him later, a little bit later, in 2007, when that first regulation was modified, because at that very moment, he was head of cabinet of the EP's president. And later on, and I can continue forever, probably, <laughs> in 2014, when the current regulation on the statute and financing of European political parties was being negotiated, he was already our secretary general. And that negotiation, uh, that regulation, the current regulation was key because European political parties acquired legal personality and the authority for European political parties and foundations was created, as Etienne already highlighted. And then he was also Secretary General when that regulation was modified later on in 2018, 2019. So with uh, all this background, this professional background, I think it's hard to find a person that can uh, give, let's say, a better first-hand testimony of how EU funding rules have been modified throughout these years and what has been the impact of those rules in the European political party system and in the EU democratic system as a whole. So please, Mr. Vele, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, in fact, I've been dealing with uh, these kind of issues for a very long time. Uh, and therefore, I have also developed maybe a very distinct uh, view on the uh, topic. But maybe let me say, uh, to start with um, what Wolf has uh, presented, uh, how different, in fact, the rules look in the different member states when it comes to execution. So it seems we have already become quite similar to the United States. Because when you remember elections in the United States, we are all the time surprised that when there's a federal election, like for example of a president, the rules that apply are completely different. Now, I'm not speaking financing, I'm more speaking how can you participate in these, uh, the famous issues of uh, absentee ballots and so on. It's a fascinating issue in itself. So it seems that federal systems have a difficulty to completely uh, unify uh, these kind of rules which are uh, important for the distribution of the influence uh, in that same uh, federal system. Uh, as it has also been uh, outlined, I've been involved in this topic over many, many years. In the late 90s, I was uh, Secretary General of the EPP party and I shared the frustration of Wilfried Martens, who told me that they had thought in Maastricht to have created a legal base for the rules on European political parties and for the financing, just to be told after ratification that the Commission thought that that legal base was not sufficient. So the question was how to proceed. Uh, then I became Secretary General of the EPP Parliamentary Group and we were confronted with a Court of Auditors report that very strongly criticized that the political groups were financing the European political parties. I mean, that's, on, that's still a mild expression of the situation because some of the parties were simply divisions, chapters uh, of parliamentary groups, uh, sitting in the parliamentary building and the Court of Auditors very clearly asked for a separation of this financing. And this was kind of the starting shot to think about, okay, how could it be done differently? And uh, that led to a reflection also among uh, the Secretary Generals of political groups on how could we create a legal base. And uh, in that circle also a formulation was elaborated which was transmitted to those who were preparing the Nice Treaty, uh, an addition to the existing treaty that then would provide such a, uh, such a legal base. Uh, and it was probably the only substantial progress that was achieved in the Nice Treaty. Uh, for the rest was relatively, uh, relatively uh, disappointing. And then as Secretary General, I had to regularly provide reports to the Bureau on the functioning of that system which sometimes did inspire, sometimes did not inspire 
the political authority in their own reflection on how to change the system. And as it has already been outlined, um, I was also responsible in proposing the budget, not adopting the budget, but proposing the initial, uh, the initial budget. A couple of uh, words uh, before I will also say how I see uh, the system on the book of uh, Wouter Wolfs. Uh, I think uh, all of you who have been reading this uh, have found out that it's incredibly well researched. Uh, I mean, you nearly have qualities of an investigative journalist, Wouter. <laughs> and uh, I was regularly, I regularly had to deal with this because you are, I don't know how, whether you counted how many access to documents requests you made, but quite many. And that's going then through our normal legal proceedings. And we say this we can share, this we cannot share. But obviously we shared quite a lot. Otherwise you wouldn't have come uh, to this uh, informed uh, view. I think that also everybody who reads it can understand very well what are the strengths of the system, what it did achieve, but also what are the weaknesses. So uh, from my point of view, and I can say that I largely share this analysis, what was achieved? First, a large degree of independence from parliamentary groups and a less less of a dependence on national parties. If there is no money, if there is no resources, we, one cannot speak of an independent European political party. Secondly, and I think that's important, uh, the European political landscape has been structured. For me, that's an advantage because the choices are becoming pretty clear. Uh, it wasn't easy at the time, not only on the very right, as you describe, also on the very left. I remember I had a conversation uh, with the leading representative of the Gur group, who was extremely critical because she said, look, we still remember the third international. You now want us to establish a fourth international. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in counting the different uh, internationals that have existed, but obviously for them this was a major challenge to try it again after obviously some very bad experiences um, that, were, uh, that were made. Um, you also, I think, identified correctly the, the weaknesses of a number of, uh, of, a number of parties uh, which uh, hopefully will be overcome and I think they can be overcome, uh, but I think the analysis is uh, correct. Uh, in my own judgment, but that's up to everybody, uh, I believe that the, uh, very much the limitation of external financing, and that's my own political belief, is extremely important. Uh, we don't want political parties to be the agents of economic interest. At least I don't want political parties to be the agents of external economic interest. And we know uh, very well the consequences if you accept that, because then those who have the money determine the politics. At least that's not my ideal, um, but of course one can think differently uh, about this and therefore the amount limitation for subventions I think are very good. So uh, to conclude, I think this work will be for a good time uh, the reference uh, for debates and probably also for the scientific debate on European political parties. Um, what is maybe also interesting to discuss today is what is the way forward. Uh, the history is always interesting, but from my point of view, the future is always more interesting than, um, more interesting than the past. And here I think we have to make a choice. Or let's say at least we have to be conscious of implicit choices that are made. Because the first question is, what model of European political parties uh, are we looking for? In the scientific literature, it's more or less universally accepted that European political parties should have the same functions as national political parties. And there's a famous reference uh, Mr. Duverger in 1957. 
And then it is being checked, are they fulfilling these criteria? The answer is no. So if they are not fulfilling these criteria, then obviously they are not proper parties and the chapter can be closed again. I believe that there is a serious mistake in thought because we need to reflect on a party political system in a federal union, and that's what the European Union is, in a different way from parties in unitary states. In a federal union, there is a dis distribution of responsibilities between the different levels of the union. And the principle of this distribution is the principle of subsidiarity. So that means the responsibilities on the federal level of the system should only be those which cannot be properly fulfilled on the national or a lower level. If we apply for a moment the same idea to the European party political system, then we would not think of European political parties like national parties, but the lead question would be which functions cannot be fulfilled by the national parties in the system and therefore following the principle of subsidiarity have to be fulfilled by the European political parties. That means if you follow this line of thought, you are looking at complementarities. But if European political parties are complementary to what national par parties are doing, then you will not find them doing what national, par what national parties are doing. And there we are meeting exactly the argument again. Maybe the outcome is that they are not doing what national, parliaments are, national parties are doing because that's exactly what they shouldn't do. In a system of subsidiarity, you should not copy and reproduce what is already correctly done. So we could more usefully think of European political parties as the European level of a party system in a federal union. Or if you want to have an image, think of the part of the iceberg that's above the waterline. The majority of the iceberg is below the waterline. And that's what everything is built on, which are the national parties. You see the part which is above the waterline, but it's an integrated system of European parties and national parties and their regional and local organizations. And this is so because this is the appropriate way to organize in a federal union of citizens and states. So... What are then, and with this I would like to conclude, uh, the specific complementary functions of European parties that national parties cannot fulfill? So what is the area of complementarity? I would like to mention six points. It's not complete. Uh, everybody who knows me knows that I'm only happy if I have ten points. So six is already a major shortcoming which proves that what I'm presenting here today is a bit haphazard. Um, but I would just like to mention what I'm thinking about, because this goes against the underestimation of European political parties. First, European political parties are the place where, to a large extent, through membership decisions, it is decided who has a chance to have a majority in the European Parliament. Yes, election campaigns play a role, but the team which you have gathered before plays at least an as important role, if not a more important role. Secondly, European political parties have to provide a common way of thinking, a common program. That seems something very easy, but it's not easy at all. All these parties come from very different tradition. I remember in my own case, uh, when we were discussing in the, in the 90s social market economy, uh, a part of the newly uh, joining party thought that social is something socialist. And it needed some explanation and discussion to say, no, that's a distinct concept and social is not socialist. But all of this needs work 
because parties, national parties, come from very different tradition. So to build a common program that's meaningful is something that's important. A core role of European political parties is to coordinate the, the decision makers on the European level of that federal system. So the members of parliament, the members of government, the members in the commission, in the committee of the region, economic and social, uh, in the economic and social committee. Parties provide access to a family or not. Parties provide legitimacy by accepting parties or not. Parties are having lead candidates and try to run campaign. And there, I fully share what Walter Wolf is saying. It's completely absurd to not allow them to be engaging all over the place. So to put it in a nutshell, my view on the function of European political parties is that they are responsible for the vertical and horizontal integration in the European party system. So horizontal integration means between the actors in parliament, in council, in the commission and in the advisory committees. Vertical integration means between the actors on the European, on the national, on the regional and on the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Velle, for, for this wonderful uh, presentation, for your insights and also for, for your ideas for the future, because this is one, probably one of the main elements we are going to, to discuss about now in the question and answer session. So um, now I will, I think, abuse a little bit my moderator role, and I will take a little bit of time to ask a few questions to, to our two speakers before giving the ground to, to the audience and allowing them to, to also make questions if they wish. And uh, uh, let's say uh, that uh, my, my first question is somehow related to, to the final point that uh, Mr. Belle uh, was making, that Klaus wa was, was making, uh, but that has also been raised, in fact, by, by Walters in, in his presentation. Because it, it is true that when we, we talk about uh, European political parties, when experts talk about European po political parties, there is a frequent uh, criticism that is raised, and it is the fact that European political parties are not grassroots organizations, that they, they are not sufficiently linked to EU citizens, to EU society, and also that in fact the funding regime that we have for them uh, has somehow lead us to that sort of situation because all the changes that have been introduced over time somehow have weakened the link between society, between citizens and, and European political parties by, for example, reducing the, the percentage of own resources that are needed for European political parties to, to match the EU grant, to match uh, the, the EU funding. So, my question that is linked to what you have already presented yourselves uh, is, okay, do you agree with this criticism? Do you think that European political parties should be uh, grassroots organizations, that they should be uh, more linked to EU citizens? And if so, would you change the financing model that we have in a different, I mean, to, to a different model that allowed uh, that could allow, let's say, European political parties to enhance their links with society. And I'm thinking in many, many different models that we could introduce, like, for example, giving funding uh, to European political parties based on the votes that they receive, based on individual membership, for example, based on the money that they are able to raise from private donators, so the, from private donations. So there are many possible models. So what do you think about this? Although some have already a little bit answered. Thank you, uh, Maria, for this question. 
how important are individual members and citizens basically in European political parties in a way that is, that is uh, your question. I think at this point their involvement is, is, is very limited, as we all know. Um, there is basically only one or two parties that have some form of individual membership at least from the from the registered uh, European political parties. But I think that, that the role of individual citizens in European political parties should be strengthened, really. Um, it is interesting because it also touches upon what kind of model do we want, what, what do we see for these European political parties and European parties as complementary actors to national parties is interesting and, and I agree to some extent with what uh, Mr. Wella was saying. But nevertheless, I think that the involvement of individual citizens is also important because exactly their linkage function that European parties have with society. I think they should have some kind of representational value in knowing what is going on in uh, on the ground, in society, among voters. And an important way to do that is to give citizens, voters, also a voice within these party organizations, I think. And you could argue that this kind of representation is already done through the national parties and national parties represent citizens and European parties represent national parties. The main problem with this is probably that uh, the longer this chain of representation becomes, the weaker the representation itself becomes because it also can become blurred in a way. So I would argue for a direct involvement of citizens in uh, these parties. Um, and it also is related to, to maybe another counter argument that I would like to put forward to the model that, that Mr. Weller was, was describing. And that is the fact that uh, this particular view on European political parties is, is rather pragmatic in a way. It is European political parties should do what national parties can't. Um, and it reminds me a bit of a general view of what the European Union should be doing for many citizens. That is, they should solve problems. But in my view, it neglects the fact that the European Union, the, the European level, is a political level, a political system in its own right, with the need for a proper ideological and political debate about particular solutions, uh, an ideological debate. And that means that it also requires a political debate, an ideological debate that is linked to, but not entirely similar to or more than the sum of 27 national debates. And I think a good way of introducing more ideological debates, more ideological positions uh, and ties with society is give them citizens, voters, a greater voice in these European party organizations. And from that perspective, a way you can change the funding rules, for example, is to um, reward European political parties for the number of individual members that they have and that also have actual membership rights that can vote in internal decision making procedures, that can vote on the policy platform, that can vote for the party leadership, for example. Uh, also because we know from national parties that individual members, uh, they actually cost more than, than, they get, get, than they get back from them, basically. So they are uh, not necessarily a source of revenue. Eh? In order to support parties also to foster this membership base, you could um, allocate part of the total funding sum uh, in proportion to the individual members that they have. But I will stop here to also give Mr. Weller the chance to, to respond. Very interesting. I see that. Uh, do, you, do you see European political parties, of course, as grassroots organizations, and you are thinking in both? sorry, a model that is more similar to the one that they have in the Netherlands, for example, in which they are funded on the basis of membership. Um, I've got the impression that the other speaker is not going to have the same ideas. <laughs> fortunate, fortunate. It works. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, <laughs> because other, <laughs> otherwise it would be very boring. <laughs> uh, but I think, nevertheless, we also have contact points. Huh? Uh, first, of course, if uh, Walter Wolf is saying that my view is pragmatic, I take this as a positive. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, um, nobody can be against trying to have more citizens' involvement or, or individual persons' involvement. The only thing I would be saying that the idea that this is then achieved through individual membership, my experience is that this is not working. Uh, you go to, you come to very low numbers, and then you have issues of legitimacy. Uh, how much weight should you give to those very low members, and how much to the parties? So, 
if we are thinking about this, uh, so how could, how could a solution look like? Maybe one could think through um, a model of reverse integration. So why not allow uh, European political parties to develop a direct relationship to the members of its member parties? So not just to the national level, not just to the leadership, but a direct relationship to the member parties. Some of the parties will have hundreds of thousands of members or tens of thousands of members. And uh, we are living in the digital age. So all of this is possible. Uh, party leaders nowadays write uh, a monthly or weekly email letter to all their members. So if they share that base, uh, why shouldn't also the president of the European party or secretary general address all the membership across Europe uh, from a central? So that would create a kind of central, a kind of central link. I think it's also important that when um, people are joining a national party, they should, they should be informed that at the same time they are joining a European party. So if you join the CDU in Germany, you're not just joining the CDU, you're joining also the European People's Party. Um, and for the moment, I think they don't get that point. So I would say if we take that point constructively to develop a closer relationship with individual people, with citizens, I think there are many things that could be done, that should be done. I also think that um, national parties should uh, carry uh, the name of the European party in their name. The system I know the best, I would say, uh, CDU, the European People's Party. You have both. So that should, nowadays, that also should no longer be separated on the national. I've been arguing that the European should not be separated, but the national system should also not separate itself from the European level. So I think it's a fruitful area to think about, but I would rather be in favor of uh, of reverse integration than to try to build up a new, completely new, separate organization, which I think will run into difficulties very, very quickly. Thank you very much. Very interesting. This complementary approach to so membership to national parties could uh, additionally be membership to European political parties, a way of, of seeing it in it. I can just add, like, if you're a citizen of Germany, you're a European citizen. You get two citizenships for the price of one. And you could, could have the same in the party system. No? But the price could be just the same one, or there could be an, an additional price, maybe, in that case, <laughs> an additional membership fee. So very interesting. And, and maybe related to, to this question, so whether uh, European political parties should be or not grassroots organizations, Let, let's go back to, to the question of, of uh, what role would European political parties play in the EU democratic process? Because, um, in fact, one major criticism that is also raised frequently when we are talking about European, politi European political parties is that they are not uh, visible enough and that they do not participate as, as much as they should, let's say, in the EU democratic process. In many cases, there are several authors that point out at the fact that they cannot put forward, for example, candidates for EU elections and that, as uh, you have already pointed out in, in the presentation, about uh, that they cannot really campaign or, or have a full campaign, let's say, uh, when European elections are, are arriving. So how do you see this criticism to, towards which models should we be heading? Do you think that European political parties should be granted uh, the, 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 the capacity to put forward candidates? fully campaign in the EU? Do we need a change in electoral rules? You have somehow suggested it, but can you maybe go into, into more details? I think so, yes, exactly, because of the, the, some of the things that are currently in place, basically. I think we need a, a pan-European district and transnational list, simply also to Europeanize the political debate in the run-up to these European elections. Eh? The, the main problem with the European elections is that they're usually mainly about national topics and not about European topics. And it has to do with the fact, and I already referred to this, that uh, the European Union is often considered to be some kind of a pragmatic level and not necessarily an ideological or a 
party political uh, level. But of course, even if you want to solve problems, you can solve these problems in different ways. A lot of these debates about these solutions are very political are very ideological, and this is a debate that we should be having in, having in the run-up to the European elections, basically. And the system as, we, uh, as it is in place now, at the moment, is yeah, not capable of generating such debates. It is too much focused on national issues. And I think a way of uh, solving this is by granting European political parties a bigger role in this, in order to foster uh, the EU debate, uh, and that is an important issue. And it would also, again, give more legitimacy to the executive politicians at, at European level. Like thinking about the Spitzenkandidaten system, in which these lead candidates also can be on the ballot on these transnational lists, uh, present themselves to voters all over Europe, uh, and that will definitely also improve the legitimacy of um, the commissioners and definitely also the president of the European Commission, just in a nutshell. Yeah, on the same question, uh, I maintain my view that uh, uh, a starting point for everything is always uh, the resource issue. If there is no money, if there is no resources, then uh, it will not go very far. And I remember uh, when I started as Secretary General of the European People's Party, I was always living in fear that one day uh, the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl might wish to visit us. Uh, because because we were living in a kind of back office and the staircase was that large, you see? Uh, the problem was the elevator was also that large. <laughs> so we would have needed to have some kind of construction in the internal courtyard to get him up there. I mean, these were the realities of things. And we were kind of subcontractors and we had to pay to the Christian Democrat International more than market price for, any co for every copy. So if the resource base is not there, all the rest is very far. Uh, I fully agree that European parties should play a stronger role in, in personnel nominations. And I was accused in 2014 by the Financial <coughs> Times to have been the devious mind behind the Spitzenkandidaten idea, which is not the case because there were many devious minds uh, which were going into the same, into the same direction. But that was a moment where the parties just took that power because governments never give the power. Would be the first time in democracy that governments freely give up power. Parliaments and uh, political parties have to take the power. So they took the power. Uh, of course, transnationalists could also be very interesting. I had a similar question asked to me in Germany um, by representative of the German government, what I think about. And I said, what I think about is the following. Please ratify first the previous reform. We had one in the last legislature with the introduction of a 4% hurdle, very much pushed by Germany. And the country that shelved the ratification was the same country, Germany, because they were living in fear of the constitutional court. So if they don't manage to ratify a 4% hurdle, I don't believe for a second uh, that they have the power to, and the, the strength to go through transnational list. But it would be another element that would be a common reference frame uh, on the European level uh, for European uh, political parties. But maybe there could also be informal ways, uh, let's say, to advance that idea, uh, because if we have to wait for the formal ways, I fear we have to wait for a very long time. So Again, very interesting and complementary approaches. Yes, uh, a clear yes, I would say, for, for transnational list and candidates coming from, from European political parties. But if I understood well, with resources, because if not, I guess there is no way of having a European, a, a truly transnational European campaign. So very interesting. And then if you allow me, I will abuse a little bit more my, my moderator role and ask a final question to both the speakers before granting you, you the, the ground, uh, before giving you the floor, sorry. So um, my third question, um, 
can, can be considered also somehow existential, if you want, for, for the funding model that we have at the EU level for political parties. Because, in fact, another criticism that is frequent when we talk about the funding model that we have at the EU level for political parties is that uh, it somehow benefits the, public, uh, the, the political parties sorry, that are already there. The, the, the political parties that are already, have already been created and are well established. And it creates a lot of hurdles, let's say, for new political parties to be created and registered at the EU level and for obtaining funding. So, as you can imagine, this is criticized by some authors saying, okay, uh, this is not good. Obviously, for EU democracy, it restrains pluralism. It does not uh, allow new political ideas to present themselves in front of the citizens. So how do you see this criticism? Do, do you think that we should maybe modify our rules to allow new political ideas, new political alliances to become European political parties and to obtain funding? And if so, how to do it. Maybe we can decouple the requirements to become a party, a European political party, and to obtain funding. We can think um, in a different, for example, a scheme, financing model for new political alliances. We can think about a different, maybe, financing scheme for you know, electoral, for electoral purposes. I mean, there are many, many different ways of doing it. What are your ideas, opinions about it? Thank you. I, I, that is related, of course, to the trade-off that exists between stability and representation in the party system. The more open a party system is, probably the more representative it is. But at the same time, it is impossible that every single citizen has its own political party. That would be untenable. And from that perspective, it's quite interesting to know that among political scientists in the 1950s and 60s, the British system was actually uh, considered one of the best because it was a stable system. You only had two parties, majority and opposition, very stable system, which, was in, which stood in stark contrast to what we have seen in the interwar period in a lot of continental countries in Europe. But of course, if you look at the British uh, system now and British politics now, I don't think it is, it is a beacon of, uh, of stability. But this is also a question, of course, in, in the European party system. Uh, and if we look at that, then in order to even become registered as a party, I don't think there is another political system in the world in which should, should such high thresholds are being imposed for, for, for parties in order simply to be registered. You need to be represented in, in a parliament in a quarter of the member states of the European Union. So you need to have parliamentary representation in a quarter of the member states. So that means that you actually, as a European party, need to have participated in at least seven national elections and be successful in order simply to have registration, recognition as a European political party. And this does not make any sense to me. Uh, I agree that, it, uh, that the threshold in order to get public funding uh, from the European budget should be quite high. I can agree to that. But at least the f in order to become registered, those conditions should be weakened, should be, should be made easier, I would say. And uh, I think it would also help to decouple the funding for the organizational functioning of political parties uh, from funding for their electoral campaigns. And it also gives the possibility to give parties with regard to elections to divide the money for elections in a more equal way in order to make sure that all the parties that fulfill certain conditions are able to reach voters and, and present their message and their solutions to voters. Uh, and that it is the strength of the message that is the most important and not the size of the, the purse that they have, the financial resources that they have. Very interesting. Uh, I see that uh, 
uh, very interesting this idea of balancing stability and pluralism of course key obviously for any any uh, democratic system and also very interesting so do you see the possibility to decouple uh, the the requirements for registering and obtaining funding but with a different scheme for electoral purposes so Yes, I, uh, I largely agree with uh, Wouter in the sense that I think there, there should be more space uh, to register as a European political party. Uh, and as he also said, I don't think that uh, that has to mean that just because you establish a party you have to receive financing. There we have the wrong incentives and that, that's maybe what existed at the beginning of the system, that parties were created to receive financing, which is also not the idea. Um, it is also true that, uh, at least for a very long time, we had uh, more parties than potential ideologies. Well, if you count through what are potential political families or ideologies, uh, we definitely had more parties than uh, ideologies, uh, which is also something, uh, let's say, which then needs maybe, um, which, which maybe needs, uh, um, needs explanation. So, um, I agree we should have we should give the possibility for more parties to be uh, to be registered I think the financing model is from my point of view okay because there is a share which is equally distributed among everybody independent of size and then there's a bigger share which is according to size and I think the incentives which are uh, created by this are the right incentives Interesting again and complementary to, to the first answer. So now I'm watching the timing. I think it's time for you to, to raise questions. So um, also uh, for those who are following us online, I remind if you want to make questions, you can do it through a slider using the QR code that has been sound, uh, sound, uh, before, that has been seen before. And uh, for those who are here, I've seen several questions there. So maybe these two. I, I'll take three questions. So I think there are two there and the lady on the right. OK. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Um, my name is Pascal Schonert. I work at the Authority for European Political Parties. Um, I uh, have um, listened with uh, great interest to your debate on um, a model of European political parties. And that is, of course, in part a legislative and a political question. Let me offer um, the account of a humble bureaucrat on the current uh, situation uh, associated with a question uh, after that. It's an account of regulatory purpose because um, you were uh, mentioning Dr. Wolfs in, in one of your theses, uh, the question of uh, what you call the regulatory straitjacket. I uh, see it as a question of regulatory purpose and I don't see it as a straitjacket consequently. I would prefer to talk of riverbanks we have very strong prohibitions in the current setup of the rules, that is true. I will give you just two examples. Donations cannot come from third countries. I think we all understand why that is so. The funding of European political parties cannot be used to fund national parties. I think we also all understand why that is so. Does that mean that the European political parties have too small a scope to act? I don't believe that. Um, I invite you to look at, um, at our website. You can see on the side of uh, the um, funding structures on the own resources side of the European political parties a great variety of funding sources as regards donations and contributions. They differ. So what I can say in this respect is that I believe that the current regulation at least does not foresee one single model of European political party. Take the membership structure. Is there a prohibition in the current regulation to have citizens as members to the European political party. There is not. They can choose that or they can leave that. 
Um, so um, there is a world of opportunities within that river of the regulatory system as it now stands for European political parties to evolve. And um, I think uh, my um, a question would be, does this, because you were talking of a straight jacket, sir, does this um, a river need to be narrowed down to one single model of European political parties? Or is it not actually a um, outcome which is understandable to the citizen uh, if that uh, river remains? Allow me uh, one uh, final remark still on the question of the European elections as well, because we have um, heard you talking, and I think it's an extremely important point about the role of the European political parties towards the European elections. Also here, the regulation foresees specifically that European political parties are entitled, I would even say encouraged, to organize their own campaign to the European elections. And here I'm coming to what uh, Klaus Welle was referring to as the complementarity. Um, um, you have mentioned uh, five conditions in your uh, speech to discuss that uh, topic of complementarity. I would say um, at the authority as a baseline, our, working is, our work in that respect is based on three conditions. They are visibility, visibility, and visibility. We believe that the legal framework as it currently stands has um, as a yardstick to offer to the European political parties that when they interact in the political arena towards the European elections, they can do so. They can do so alongside the member parties or they can do so autonomously. What they have to do is they have to do it in a way that makes them perceivable as such to the citizen in order to be able to offer financing for it. And hence also there, my impression is that the straight jacket is not so straight after all. I'll be glad to hear your uh, comments on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this intervention and question. Um, him and then the lady. If you um, could introduce yourself, of course. that could be. Uh, my name is Louis Renault and I belong to European Democracy Consulting. You made a clear and interesting link uh, in the title of this event uh, between the financing of European political parties and European democracy. You call it a vibrant democracy. You have shown, on the one hand, a massive increase in the public funding of European political parties since 2004. You have mentioned, however, that European political parties remain, um, by and large, unknown to European citizens, which I take it as a small contribution to democracy, in a sense. If you could have a wish granted to you, I know you've just mentioned avenues for reform, what would you ask for in the change of the financing of European parties that you believe would make a notable contribution to European democracy? What would you ask for? Thank you. My name is uh, Stella Velighi. I have studied physics and informatics. I am a member of the European, uh, of the European Physical Society. And I have a, a two small questions. Um, the first one is um, how much are involved directly or indirectly the non-European country, and especially Russia, in financing the European Part, political parties. Russia is involved in, in uh, European elections. Russia is involved in financing very far right and very far left national parties that are present in Parliament, uh, in European Parliament. And uh, for me, it's logical to ask this question, even if, if legally it's not uh, uh, allows us. Um, and my second question is, you don't, you have in the European Parliament independent map that belong to any political party. Um, um, there are maps who, who left their political party or they are thrown out from the political party. 
uh, how do you um, finance them? How do you, they are the same rights, they are not the same rights, they are the same financing condition or not? How do you deal with that? Okay. Thank you very much. So maybe I'll give you first the, the floor. Uh, sure. Outer, the question. I'll pick out a number of, of, of issues um, on, on the riverbank. Uh, question basically of, of Mr. Schonar. What you can do as a regulator are basically five things, right? You can either ban certain things, you can hamper certain behavior, you can be neutral, you can incentivize or you can compel, you can force certain behavior on, on political parties. Um, and obviously, in some cases, some of these things, some things need to be banned. Uh, if we think about foreign donations, I would agree that this is not a good thing. A ban on direct support to national political parties is also something that I would support in the sense that we want to avoid that European parties become nothing more than simple redistribution vehicles, right, of EU funding to national parties. That is something that we, that we want to avoid. With regard to indirect support, I probably have a bit of a, a, a different uh, view in the sense that now it is it is very strong in the regulation, right? It is, it is totally banned, but it also hampers really joint activities between these national parties and the European parties and also in the electoral campaigns. I see you <laughs> that you that you disagree with me on this, but I mean, there are, for example, political parties that have told me, okay, we want to do a training for national politicians with regard to, to, to electoral campaigns, and that is something that we cannot do because it is considered indirect support to, to, uh, to national candidates. I think this is an example that goes too far. I also think that it should be allowed for European parties to uh, campaign on behalf of their national member parties, because that is a system that we currently have in place, not through financial transactions, but they can support together with them, um, and also ask maybe a citizens to vote for that particular member party, because that strengthens the link for voters, the visibility that there is such a link and such a tie. That doesn't mean that it would be possible if it is allowed at European level, because at national level there are a lot of rules in place that would uh, ban this particular aspect. Uh, the same with individual membership. The fact that it is not banned, that it is allowed, does not necessarily mean that it, that, that it is zero or one, that is black or white, you allow or you don't allow. You can also incentivize it, and that would be uh, my main argument and my plea, which I also made uh, before. Incentivize parties in order to foster this individual membership base and try to engage individual members and voters indirectly or directly through members of national parties in their internal functioning. That would increase their visibility and that would also be good for EU democracy in general. Um, and that would probably also uh, be, Louis, one of the main things that I would, would, would change in the system as it is currently in play, place. These two elements. Uh, indirect support for national party and, and, and membership. Then the third question on, on foreign interference. That's also very sensitive and it's also one of the reasons why, why the, the report and the, the changes to the funding rules are currently blocked. Eh? To what extent can, for example, also non-EU parties uh, make membership contributions to European political parties. I'm personally in, in favor of this within certain limitations, but I would be in favor of this, uh, and I can explain later why. Um, but we all know, of course, that I think up to 10 EU countries with regard to party finance law, it is still possible for foreign donors to donate to national political parties. So it is also possible that through these national parties, money from outside of the EU comes into these European political parties. Of course, um, the role that European political parties play in the political system of the EU currently is rather limited. So with regard to um, Influence buying through the European political parties, at this point the risks are more limited. There are other um, issues at hand, I would say, uh, with regard to that. And with regard to the non-attached, I can assume that the former Secretary General can answer this, but they, are, they also receive funding yeah, uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, so in order to support their functioning, so I, from that perspective, they are uh, not discriminated against, I would say. I don't know. Yes, uh, maybe from my side, uh, two remarks um, on the funding and also on the increase of uh, funding. We always have to be aware of the base, in fact, uh, base effect. 
because if you start from zero, uh, everything above zero sounds looks massive. Um, you see, so I see this rather as, uh, let's say, uh, establishing um, a basic financing. And if we look to a similar political system, of course, more developed, older, and that's the United States, uh, then the, the amounts available for, for European political parties are absolutely dwarfed. Even if we look at uh, bigger member states, uh, the amounts available here are very little uh, compared to what is available in those bigger member states and from public financing. So, yes, this has been a phase of building it up. Uh, but the overall amounts which are now available, if we are looking at that, we, we have to support a continental democracy or a democracy of continental scale with more than 440 million European citizens is in fact not uh, exaggerated. Uh, the second remark I would like to make on uh, how to deal with non-EU countries and uh, foreign intervention. Um, again, we have to be a bit careful about the words uh, which we are using uh, because the moment a country is recognized as candidate country, I don't look at them as foreign. The moment we are negotiating with countries about adhesion to the European Union, can we really say this is just foreign, just a third country, have nothing to do with this? The moment we give a candidate status, we say, we believe that in the future you should belong to us under the condition that these negotiations are correctly done. So it must be possible then for also for those parties to integrate, probably in a step-by-step -step way. Um, candidate status is not membership, uh, negotiation is not yet membership, but they should have the possibility to have a status in European political parties and they also should have a possibility to contribute probably to a lesser extent, uh, but they, uh, they have been recognized as potential members of the family and therefore they can no longer be treated as just uh, any other third country. Yeah, maybe to add one sentence about this, I think this is important because the enlargement process is more than simple economic integration or legal integration about regulatory systems, it is also political integration about society, citizens and political elites. And I don't think there, is, there are any other actors that can fulfill uh, that can act as vehicles for political integration than European political parties, and that's why it's so important that they also have links with, uh, with non-EU member parties, especially in candidate countries. So an idea for those who are negotiating the, the current deal on, I mean, the, the current modification of the regulation. I don't know if we have any questions from, from the online, from the on, people yep. participating online. Okay. Uh, we do, Walter, so I can see you. Um, there's one question asking, do you think that the proposal for new regulation that is being discussed will finally be approved? And if so, will it really change something in the way you mentioned it should change to improve democracy? Okay. We just stick to one. <laughs> Difficult question, will it be approved? At this point, I'm not so optimistic. Um, Maybe something that I will touch upon because we haven't discussed it before is uh, respect, for the f respect for the fundamental values. Eh? So one of the conditions to be registered and to receive funding as a European political party is that you need to respect the fundamental values uh, of the European Union. Uh, in the past, we've had parties in which there were questions whether to what extent they respected the fundamental values of the EU. But a lot of it had to do with the behavior of their member parties, basically. And the way that it was phrased in the regulation before is that the behavior of the national member parties was actually not that important to assess whether or not the European political party respects the fundamental values. And that is, for example, a change that is now uh, proposed in, um, in the current uh, new rules and if that would be put in place I think that would be a very good thing but as I already mentioned I'm not that optimistic at this point that there will be new funding rules uh, in place before the next European elections. So final word on, on the current regulation do you think it would be approved or? <laughs> I don't know whether it will be approved but I must say it would be a pity if and that's the point I just made if uh, there would not be a possibility for those who want to join us to acquire, to acquire proper status in European political parties. I mean, when Ukrainian parties want to participate, 
uh, we would uh, run co against everything we are currently doing uh, if we want, would not allow them to join European political parties, even might it be with an observer or another status. So thank you very much indeed. It's time now, so I think we should leave it here, but uh, thank you very much for coming. It was a, a pleasure and uh, see you in the next book talk, hopefully. Bye.